Hello people, welcome. Uh, today I'm going to teach you this concept called as pipelining. Pipelining uh, single-handedly is the biggest reason why processors have become so fast. I'm sure from your own experience you know, over the years processors and computers in general are becoming faster and faster by the year. Now, how do processors become fast? Tomorrow when you have an interview and somebody asks you, give me tricks to make a processor faster, basic ideas. There are various, various uh, reasons why a processor can become fast. Number one, increase the size of its buses, increase the hardware, especially the data bus. If you increase the size of the data bus, a processor can grab more data at a time. That means it will work faster because it will require less cycles to do the same job. A 16-bit data bus can transfer 16 bits at a time as compared to an 8-bit data bus which would require 2 cycles to transfer 16-bit data. So increasing the data bus can make the processor faster. But that has peaked out a long time back. Pentium 1 in 1993 was released with a 64-bit data bus. Today virtually everything still works on a 64-bit data bus. So that's not the only reason. Number two, you can increase uh, the clock frequency, the frequency at which the processor works. Primitive processors used to work at 3, 4, 5, 6 megahertz. Today everything works at 3.2, 3.4, 3.6 gigahertz. So this is, yes, a primary reason to make a processor fast. But again, uh, 2004 processors were available working at 3.2, 3.4 gigahertz. That's pretty much the frequency even today. So for more than a decade, the frequency has not increased for almost two decades or even more. The size of data bus has not increased, but still processors are becoming faster. So what is it that's making processors faster by the day? Single-handedly, the biggest contributor to that is the concept of pipelining. So that's what I'm going to teach you today. I'm Bharat Acharya. Uh, welcome to my new video. Uh, let's start. Now, I'm teaching you pipelining with respect to the first processor that introduced pipelining, that is 8086. I'm going to start with that and then I'm going to expand the concept further. I'm going to teach you pipelining in the modern systems as well. But we're starting with the most basic form. So, as I said, pipelining makes a processor faster. So, we compare two processors, a non-pipeline processor like 8085 and a pipeline processor like 8086. We are comparing them on the scale of time. We will give both processors the same program and we'll see who executes it faster. Okay, let's start. First, let's talk about 8085. Suppose we have a program of five instructions. Now, I'm sure you have this basic idea. Instructions are stored in the memory, no matter which processor you're learning. Instructions are not stored inside the processor. They are stored in the memory. Every instruction, first of all, has to be fetched from the memory, then decoded inside the processor, and then executed. Okay, so let's start. 885, it has to do five instructions. First of all, it will fetch the first instruction. So that will take some time. This is the time required to fetch the first instruction. After that, it will decode the instruction, which of course takes time. But that time is so small that it is insignificant in the context of the big picture. So I'm not sure. Yet. So by now, the first instruction is fetched and decoded. Then it will execute the first instruction. Then execution again will take some time. By now, 885 has finished the first instruction. Now what will I do? Immediately move on to the next instruction. Fetch the second instruction, execute the second, then fetch the third, execute the third, blah blah. By this much time, 885 will finish five instructions. Are you clear? Now that was a non-pipeline processor. So this is the time required to do five instructions. Now, if you look at a pipeline processor like 8086, it's a two-stage pipeline processor. What does it do? The idea is so simple, it's unbelievable how people didn't come up with this idea before. Again, even in 8086, programs are stored in the memory. Again, first of all, it will have to fetch an instruction. Good. To fetch the instruction, it will require the buses. Understand, get the picture right. This is the processor, this is the memory. To connect them, you have the buses. To fetch the first instruction, the buses are required. Once the instruction has been fetched, where is it executed? In the bus or in the processor? Of course, it's executed in the processor. So while the processor is executing the first instruction, if you realize the buses are totally free, that's what Intel people realize after making 885 that here we have an opportunity to increase the performance. You are executing an instruction inside the processor. Your buses are free at that time. Why not make them fetch the next instruction? When? Not after execution. During execution. Execution is happening inside the processor. Execution is happening inside the processor. At the same time, the buses will be used to fetch the second instruction. So what will be the advantage? The moment first instruction has been executed, the processor is ready to immediately start 
executing the second instruction. Side by side will fetch the third, execute the third, fetch the fourth, execute fourth, fetch fifth, execute fifth, finish. This is the time required to execute five instructions as compared to the time required by a non-pipeline processor. So it's there right in front of you how pipelining improves performance. So to make it very simple, how did 885 work? It would fetch, then it would execute, then fetch, then execute, then fetch, then execute. How does 886 work? It will fetch, execute, 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 execute. All it will do thereafter is just execution. Is it fetching? Of course it is fetching. How can it not fetch? But that time is not being shown because it's happening alongside execution. Fetching and execution are happening during the same time. One instruction is being executed, side by side the next instruction is being fetched. So this is how in 886 pipelining is defined. To give a formal definition, fetching the next instruction while executing the current instruction. I'll say it again, fetching the next instruction while executing the current instruction. If somebody asks you, why was there no pipelining in 8085? If you learned 885 architecture, if you have not, I have made a video for it. The link would be down in the description in the description section. You can check out my channel, you will see the video. So 885 architecture was a single unit. So it could do only one thing at a time. 886 architecture, which again I am going to post very soon. The links will be there in my channel. 886 architecture is created in two different units. It's in two independent units. One unit for fetching of instructions, the other unit for execution. Both units work simultaneously. So first one instruction is fetched. While it is being executed, the next instruction starts getting fetched. Both of them happen simultaneously. There are therefore the time gets shrunk and that's how the performance increases. So now, this was very easy to understand. This is a two-stage pipeline. After this, the Intel engineers realized this concept has massive potential. If you break down an instruction cycle into several stages and make independent units for each of them, you can take performance to a very high level. Now, I'll just give you a brief idea. I'm going to summarize 30 years of development in the next two minutes. After a two-stage pipeline came a three-stage pipeline. A three-stage pipeline architecture is divided into three independent units. One for fetching, one for decoding, one for execution. So you understand? One instruction is fetched. While it is being decoded, second gets fetched. While it's being executed, the second gets decoded and third gets fetched. That means it's working on three instructions at a time. Then came four stage pipeline. Fetch, decode, execute, store. Do understand this. Once you have executed an instruction, you have a result. That result has to be stored somewhere. Also, if you're sharp, executing and storing the result are actually two different things. Execution means doing some operation like add, subtract, multiply, divide. And storing the result means what? Whatever result you got putting in the appropriate register or appropriate memory location. So if you make two independent units to do that, what will happen? The first instruction has been fetched, decoded, executed, stored. By its result is being stored. The second is being executed, the third is being decoded, the fourth is being fetched. That means it's working on four instructions at a time. Then came remarkable five-stage pipeline, started with 486, improved by Pentium. So I'm going to take example of Pentium. Pentium has a five-stage pipeline. I would love to explain all the stages, but that's now becoming irrelevant. You just understand the point. If there are five stages, that means Pentium is working on how many instructions at a time? Five? No. Ten. How? It is a five-stage pipeline. Hear me. It is a five-stage pipeline, but it has two such pipes. This concept of having multiple pipes is called super scalar pipelining. I repeat, super scalar pipelining. A, you are increasing the number of stages in pipeline. B, you are having parallel pipes like this. So Pentium is a five-stage pipeline with two such pipes. That means there are 10 instructions going on together. Now, if you're sharp, tell me, how will the 10 instructions be distributed? Will it be one, two, three, four, five in one pipe and six, seven, eight, nine, ten in the other pipe? No, because what will happen? 1 and 6 will be executed, then 2 and 7 will be executed. That means the entire order of the program will change. This also happens in out-of-order execution. That's very heavy level of pipelining, but Pentium didn't use it, do this. So in Pentium, it's very simple. The first and the second instruction enter the pipes. Then the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. So if one pipe has 1, 2, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. The other pipe has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, etc. Anyway, so that first two get executed, then third, fourth, then fifth, sixth, etc. Now, this concept got increased further and further. Now, cutting the long story short, uh, 2000, the year 2000, Intel came up with Pentium 4 Netburst architecture. In Netburst architecture, there are four such pipes. Like how Pentium had two pipes, Netburst has four such pipes. And each pipe is a mind-blowing 
20 stage pipeline i repeat 20 stage pipeline so if one pipe is a 20 stage pipeline it can hold 20 instructions four such pipes that means pentium 4 net burst works on 80 instructions at time do you understand what a massive jump in performance you get compare that to your good old 8085 it works on one instruction at a time 8086 works on two instructions at a time as you increase the level of pipelining you increase the level of parallelism and that's how processors over the years have become faster and faster and yet this is where all the development is taking place if you want to still just bridge the gap and just come to the modern world as to how all this is taking place in the modern world this concept of multiple pipes later on got expanded and evolved into multiple cores it's not exactly the same thing but it's on the same lines so these multiple cores today you have quad core you have hexa core you have octa core processors so treat them as separate pipes each of them being a multi-stage pipeline that's how processors are becoming fast so that's a good thing about pipelining somebody asks you what's the advantage yeah it's an obvious advantage makes the processor faster but there are drawbacks there are some serious drawbacks there is data dependency if the result of one instruction becomes the source of the next instruction then the next instruction cannot start till the time the first instruction is completely over otherwise it will not get new data so that's called data dependency issue which is solved at the assembler level by inserting nops and by just doing good programming then there is another perennial drawback of pipelining it's been there since the time pipelining sta started uh, it's called branching see Suppose we are executing the first instruction. These are instructions of a program. We are executing the first instruction. According to pipelining, what else are we doing? From what I taught you, what else are we doing? While we are executing the first instruction, we are also fetching the second instruction. So here's my question. Why are we fetching the second? Why not the third or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth? Why second? Because programs are executed. Yeah, you are right. Because programs are executed in a sequential manner. After the first, you will require the second. So beforehand, you are fetching the second. So here's my point. Pipelining assumes that a program will always execute in a sequential manner. Now that is true. It's not wrong. Programs are executed sequentially, but not always. I'm sure you have done programming in some language or the other. You encounter ifs, you encounter functions, you encounter loops. Now in all these cases, the program doesn't go sequential. Program takes a branch. Simplest example, if. If you write if followed by a condition, the condition is satisfied, you go straight ahead. Otherwise, you take a jump to some other location. Now, what happens if the first instruction says, I want to jump to location number 8. After the first instruction, the 8th instruction should be executed. But second instruction has been fetched. When did second get fetched? After execution or during execution? During execution. That's what pipeline is. While you are executing an instruction, you are fetching the second. So processor has accidentally fetched the second instruction, but should it be executed? No ways, because the program has taken a jump. So the instruction that has been fetched has to be discarded. This is what we say. Pipelining fails whenever there is a branch. The instruction that is fetched is no longer valid. It has to be discarded. Program goes to a new location. And of course, we'll continue pipelining. We'll again fetch instruction number eight. While executing eight, we'll fetch instruction number nine, and so on. Just momentarily, pipelining fails whenever there is a branch. Now, Again, if you're seriously paying attention and you want to understand all this, this drawback of branching becomes more severe as the level of pipelining increases. In a two-stage pipeline, what was the penalty? One instruction. In a three-stage pipeline, the penalty will be two instructions. I hope you understand that. If you have 80 instructions going on, 80 instructions, different operations are going on of 80 instructions. The first instruction says, I'm going to take a jump. 79 instructions after that which have already been partly processed they all have to be discarded so as this penalty increases with the increase in the level of pipelining there is a solution to this the solution to this problem is called as branch prediction algorithm i repeat branch prediction algorithm it was started by pentium and thereafter it's been done by every processor it's such a remarkable algorithm i'm not doing that right now because that's a whole separate uh, topic it's a big topic but just to give you a gist of it Pentium maintains a history, it's called branch target buffer. It maintains a history of 256 previous jumped instructions, branch instructions, and keeps a track whether these instructions actually jump or not. If it jumps, most likely it will jump again. Most programs are repetitive in nature, like a loop. If you do a loop of 100 iterations, 99 times you have jumped, the 100th time you didn't. So when you jump the first time, if you keep track that this instruction jumps, the remaining 98 times at least, 
you'll make a correct prediction just from the history. So that's called branch prediction. I just summarize it in a nutshell. It's a very deep algorithm. But anyways, that algorithm gives you an accuracy of around 98-99%, which is remarkable. So this problem has a solution, but not in 8086. In 8086, the problem is too small, so we live with this problem. In higher processor, the problem is solved. So that's about pipeline. Uh, I hope you understood what pipeline is and how it makes a processor faster. In detail, this whole topic is explained as I keep telling. It's all there in my book. This book is about 8086. It has everything a student of 8086 would want to know. It's interfacing, it's architecture, the entire programming, designing of circuits, motherboard, A to D converters, D to A converters, etc. etc. The book is available on Amazon. Uh, the soft copy is available on Kindle. The links for both of them will be there in the description section. Thank you so much for watching my videos. Uh, I've been really, really uh, uh, glad with the response that I've been getting. And I hope you keep uh, continue, continue to watch it. And any suggestions that you have, you're most welcome to give them. And I will try my best to post as many videos as fast as possible. It's, it's really, it clashes with my real-time teaching schedule. But anyways, I'm enjoying doing this now. So I'm going to post as much as I can as soon as possible. Have a nice time. All the best.